Let's close our eyes for prayer. Father, we thank you for our Bible study tonight. We bless your name because we know you are a great God. What a mighty God you are to have sent Jesus Christ to save us from our sins. Oh Lord, we thank you because you've made us partakers of their salvation. We pray, Lord, that you grant us the conviction and the courage to be able to go out all around and tell everybody that Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Lord, we pray while we're announcing to all the people that Jesus saves, we ourselves will keep standing in the will of God in the salvation of the Lord in Jesus' name. We're praying, O oh Lord, that tonight you open our eyes of understanding and will behold wondrous, wonderful things out of your word in Jesus' name. Bless your people tonight in the study of the word of God. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. A good amen. amen. Thank you very much. God bless every one of you. Please be seated. Tonight we come to the Bible study once again. And I praise the Lord for every one of us at the Bible study. What a wonderful thing to devote a night like this and evening every week to study the word of God. And the Lord has been richly blessing us in the study of the word. We're now in Revelation chapter 17. Last week, last Monday, we looked at Revelation chapter 17, verses 1 through to 6. And today we're looking at verses 7 all through to 18. Let me read to you in verse 7. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore this thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has seven, the seven heads and ten horns. John the Beloved had seen the vision, and it was a vision of a particular woman. And John the Beloved, looking at the appearance, and looking at the apparel, and looking at everything surrounding that woman, became so amazed and so surprised at what he saw. But to him it was a mystery. You read in verse 6, it says, And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints, and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great amazement, admiration, astonishment. And so John the Beloved was surprised. And when he got surprised, he wanted to understand, he wanted to know the mystery of this woman that he saw. And that's why the angel now came to him and said, Why are you surprised? Why do you marvel? I will tell you. I will reveal to you. I will interpret it to you. I will make you to understand the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which has seven heads and ten horns. That's what we're looking at today. John the Beloved saw this vision. The woman sitting on the scarlet-colored beast. And he was astonished and surprised at the appearance and the apparel of the woman. He wondered with great amazement, astonishment, bewilderment as well, at what he had seen, at what, at what the woman or the beast will symbolize. And then the angel said unto me, Wherefore this thou marvel, I will tell thee, number one, the ministry of the woman, number two, the mystery of the beast that carrieth her, which has seven heads and ten horns. One of the seven angels pointing out the verse of God's wrath observed that John was surprised and amazed at what he saw. He asked why was John surprised and he offered to interpret the vision to him. And he said, I will tell you, I will reveal to you, I will explain to you the meaning of the symbol and the hidden meaning of what you have seen. The explanation is what you'll find in uh, chapter 17, verses 8, all through to verse 18. But before I go to the interpretation and the mystery of this woman and the beast, uh, you need to understand that this vision is something that you need to understand because it's very, very important to your salvation and it's very, very important to your steadfastness in the Lord. As the Lord showed a vision to Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 2, looking at 
verse 2 and verse 3. The Lord told Habakkuk something about that vision in Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 2. And the Lord answered me and said, write the vision, make it plain upon the tables that he, that, that he may run that readeth it. And the same thing we shall apply to this revelation and the mystery of the beast and the woman. Make it plain. Make it clear. Apply it. That he that heareth, he that readeth, may run. In verse 3, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it. Because it will surely come, it will not tarry. And the same thing you can apply to the vision that God had shown, that the Lord Jesus had shown unto the beloved apostle John. And as he was amazed, the Lord now sent the angel, and the angel was going to interpret. And when you hear the interpretation, you ought to hear and run. Because we're told in this place, it says, write it, make it clear, make it plain, that he, that he may run, that readeth it. What does that mean? Read and run. Read, reflect. When you look at this vision, when you see this vision, when you see what the Lord is going to do, meditate, think, reflect. Number two, repent. When you see this vision and you see what is going to happen, you reflect on the interpretation, on the meaning, on the significance of that vision. After reflecting, repent. Number three, return. If you've been far away and you are dabbling into this and dabbling into that, and you're not concentrating, you're not paying attention. And it appears that the devil is stealing your heart away from the very center of the purpose of God, the plan of God, and the will of God. Return. Return to the Lord. Because the vision is about to be fulfilled. Number four, restore. If there are things in your hand that will be like a heavy weight. That will tie you down. That will hold you down. And that heavy weight will not allow you to fly when the rapture is going to take place. Because the time is about now. Restore. Return all those things. Restitute. Give back all those things. Don't allow any weight to be in your life. That will tie you down. Hold you down. Keep you down. When the Lord shall come. Number five. Respond. This is not a study we can just hear and then take our Bibles and go back home without any response. Because this is a study you read and run. You hear and run. You run with it. You respond. Number six, you rekindle the fire of evangelism. Because we have relatives and we have friends that are dying in sin and they do not understand the significance of what we're studying or what we're reading therefore we read and run and we rekindle the fire of evangelism we go to tell other people number seven we reveal you go to reveal to other people read it and run with it read it and go and tell other people read it and go and reveal to other people there are many people that are still in mystery babylon and they're in the, in the polluted church and the corrupted church and they're in the apostate church and they're in the fallen church a church where they're following the traditions of Babylon and the people do not know and they think they're serving the Lord read and run read and run to the people and reveal to them read and reach out you reach out to the people that are perishing and that's what the Lord is telling us. We're not just doing child's play when we come to a uh, money Bible study and we come to study the book of Revelation. We read, we run, we reflect, we repent, we return, we restore, we respond, we rekindle the fire of evangelism, we reveal the truth to other people, we reach out to them. In Isaiah chapter 21, Isaiah chapter 21. I'm reading from verse 11 and in verse 12. Isaiah chapter 21, verse 11, the burden of Duma. He calleth me to me out of seer, watchman, water of the night. Watchman, water of the night. He's uh, asking the people that know the mystery of the things to come. The mystery of the night that is going to come upon this world. And it says, watchman, what of the night? Watchman, what of the night? The watchman said, the morning cometh. The morning forth, the morning of resurrection. 
and the morning of the rapture and the morning of rejoicing the morning cometh and also the night after the morning of resurrection the morning of rapture the morning of rejoicing there will be the darkness of the great tribulation the night cometh if ye will inquire inquire ye return come don't waste time read and run and respond to the word of God as we're hearing. We come back to Revelation chapter 17. In Revelation chapter 17, when John saw this, he was amazed, he was surprised. And then in his amazement and wonder, the angel came to him in verse 7 and said, The angel said to me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee, I will reveal to you, I will interpret to you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath seven heads and ten horns. And the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. In verse 9, and here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman seated. And there are seven kings, five are falling, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, and even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sowest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is the Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sowest, where the war, war was seated, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues, and the ten horns which thou sowest upon the beast, these shall hate the worm, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire for God has put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled and the woman which thou sowest is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth that's the interpretation that the angel gave to John Jesus is coming back to establish righteousness on the earth. But before he does this, he has to destroy all ungodliness and all evil out of this world. All false systems of religion are to be removed. There will be the destruction of the religious Babylon. Religious Babylon is a mystery. Isn't it a mystery? How can a body of people, how can a group of people, multitudes of people, intelligent ones, educated ones, even people that are mighty and powerful, how can they claim to be worshipping God and yet they are honoring rituals above God? That's a mystery. The religion of the last days will join hands or the government of the Antichrist and institutionalize horrors atrocities and abominations the great seduction of the religion of the apostate church is horrifying the vision of what is coming on this earth left john in a state of bewilderment and amazement wondering how such could ever take place you say but since they are for the last days at the time of the great tribulation what concerns you now what concerns me now what concerns the church now in first john chapter 2 verse 18 first john chapter 2 reading from verse 18 little children believers it is the last time and as ye have heard that the antichrist shall come even now are there many antichrists whereby we know that it is the last time 
the things that will happen at the time of the great tribulation that is at the time when the antichrist will be ruling and reigning it is already happening now because even now there are, there are many antichrists which tells us these are the very last times and the little little antichrist now not as mighty as the antichrist that shall come they are preparing the ground for the coming antichrist we're told in second thessalonians chapter 2 reading from verses 3 and 4 Second Thessalonians chapter 2, reading from verses 3 and 4. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped. So that he has God seated in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Here he tells us that there be a falling away force. That is, there be an apostasy, apostasy force. That is, the people of the religious world, they'll fall away from the truth force. And then after that, when they have totally uh, gone away, it is then that the Antichrist in his full force will come upon this world. In First Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 and 2. First Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 and 2. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils speaking lies in hypocrisy having their conscience seared with a hot iron and the word of god tells us that in these last days just before the coming of the antichrist that many are going to depart from the faith there'll be backsliding there'll be apostasy there'll be the falling away and then there'll be the giving heed, giving heed to seducing spirits, enticing spirits, the spirit of enticement, the spirit of seduction that will lure them away from the real truth and then to the doctrines of devils. And you'll be surprised it's a mystery how some intelligent people can believe demonic doctrines today but they are doctrines of the devil that many many people believe and we see them and sometimes if you are not careful if you do not understand the mystery mystery babylon if you don't understand yourself to all well worshiping god they mention jesus they read the bible they're just like us no they are not like us because it says they'll believe the doctrines of devils speaking lies in hypocrisy speaking lies in hypocrisy many things they'll say as testimony they are lies and it's to deceive people it's to it's to destroy people it's to damn their souls in hellfire and then it says having their conscience seared with a hot iron it's like uh, the devil has taken their consciences away. There's no conscience anymore. And that's why the Lord is telling us that we need to be aware. And this is the time we need to call upon the Lord and say, I understand the vision. I have heard about this vision. I've seen the interpretation of the vision. Read it and run. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, I'm reading verses 3 and 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own laws shall they heed to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. Those are the days in which we are living, and they are the days when the Antichrist is preparing the ground to actually come. That's why we're looking at this revelation today, at this mystery today, and we're looking at the interpretation of the mystery the mystery of the woman and the beast and i divide the study into three parts number one the description and the destiny of the monster the antichrist the description and the destiny of the monster the antichrist number two the decision and defeat of the monster and his army the decision and the defeat of the monster and his army. Number three, the desolation and destruction of the mother of abominations. The desolation and the destruction of the mother of abominations. I come to point number one. The description and the destiny of the monster, the Antichrist. It tells us, reading from verse 8 now, we read verse 7 already. In verse 8, the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition 
and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. It talks about this beast and in the explanation and the interpretation of, of who this beast actually represents, we understand this is that Antichrist, the beast. He was and is not now and yet shall be. That means his power had been manifested before the power of evil, the power of darkness. As you think about this, it's referring to this Antichrist, and he had an existence in the past in the form of evil, wicked, anti God government, but ceases to be for a time. Then he is to ascend out of the bottomless pit. That's exactly what we read about in those verses I read to you now. And it will be the very incarnation of Satan, of the devil, and it, it will be evil devilish beyond any sin that man had ever seen on the face of the earth. It will embody and include all the terrorizing traits of the ancient empires. And then he talks about the seven heads, the seven heads and the seven mountains on which the woman seated. Anybody that knows about Rome will understand that Rome actually sits on seven hills. And this is referring majorly to Rome, the empire of Rome, and the first mystery religion coming out of Rome. The kingdom or government of the Antichrist will subdue and embody the seven great kingdoms. Its power will be great and supernaturally evil. That is, it will not just be evil on the human level. It will be evil in the supernatural level, in the satanic level. And then we know that the Lord Jesus will come eventually and conquer him. But before the Lord Jesus Christ comes, this Antichrist will conquer three more kingdoms. That's why you read in the following verses on the ten horns, which thou sawest, are ten kings. These kingdoms will be under the power of the Antichrist and they will form a great alliance with him. Don't you see in verse, in the, in verse uh, uh, look at it in uh, chapter 17 of Revelation. Chapter 17 in, of Revelation, it tells us, as we read further in verse 8, the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and then will eventually go into perdition. Then in verse 9, and here is a mind which has wisdom. Seven heads and seven mountains, on which the woman seated. And until the Lord Jesus will come, during the time of the great tribulation, false religion, mystery Babylon, will be well established in the minds of the people, and they will have, it will be like real Roman religion. And then he tells us in verse 10, and there are seven kings, five are falling, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue for a short space. The Lord will not allow that uh, evil one, that satanic one, to continue indefinitely. He will come, he will only appear and remain there and reign for just a short time. And the beast that was and is not, even he, is the eighth and is of the seven and goes into perdition. That's the second time it's telling us that the end of this Antichrist and the end of that beast, the end of the first prophet that will join along with him, will be perdition, hellfire, the lay of fire will go into perdition in verse 12 and the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet but receive power as kings one hour with the beast just telling us it will be a very short time and that tells us then that we really need to be very careful in these last days. And as we learned last week that you don't want to go and join Mystery Babylon. You don't want to go and join a kind of religion that is not totally standing, squarely standing on the totality of the word of God. And let's look at the scriptures and see the coming of this Antichrist. He will come. But the church will have gone before he comes. And I pray that at that time you will not be here in Jesus' name. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And I'm reading to you from verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. 
because they are deceivers all over the land. They are deceivers in every country. And it says, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. A falling away first. What's the meaning of that? Churches falling away from the truth. Individuals falling away from some doctrine. Whole denominations falling away from the totality of the word of God. They believed in the past. They'll be shifted from their root. They'll be uprooted from the very sun doctrine they were holding on to before. And they'll be shifted to another thing. And it says that they shall not come. That is the appearance, the revelation of the Antichrist will not really appear until the falling away will come forth. And then it says, and that man of sin be revealed. That is the Antichrist. The son of perdition. Do you remember when we read in Revelation chapter 17? He shall go to perdition. And then we read second time again, he goes unto perdition. And here his title is the son of perdition. In verse 4, who opposes and exalted himself above all that is called God. He'll be proud. He will rise up. And then he'll make himself God. He'll or seat or that is worship. So that he has got seated in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. And then Paul the Apostle the Thessalonians said, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his own time. In the timetable of God, the Antichrist will be revealed. And then the Bible says, uh, the Spirit of God is telling us, you know who is withholding now? You know who is delaying now? You know who is hindering that Antichrist from coming now? It's the church. Because the church is still here and we are the light of the world. The totality of darkness cannot really take over until the light is gone, until the church is gone. That's why it says in the next verse, in verse uh, in verse uh, 6, it says, sorry, in verse 7, the mystery of iniquity does already work. The spirit of the Antichrist is already at work. And the spirit of falling away from the truth is already at work. Only he who now leteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Only he who hinders, who restrains, only he who limits him will limit him, will restrain him, will cover him up, will not allow him to break out like an uncontrollable, irresistible force until the church be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, that's the Antichrist, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Then he tells us even him, that's the Antichrist, whose coming is after the walking of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. So then we understand that that Antichrist is coming in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. I'm reading from verses 7 and 8. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, the fourth beast dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it has great iron teeth, and it devoured and break in pieces, and stamped the residue of the feet with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the bees that were before it, and it had ten horns. There we are again, the ten horns. And the ten kingdoms, and the ten heads, or the seven heads. And I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there was three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man. That's talking of intelligence. The Antichrist will be very, very intelligent and will see what we'll have insight. Insight, that's knowledge, that's scientific knowledge too. And he must speak in great things. He'll speak great, great blasphemies. But you know when we read in Revelation chapter 17 verse 8, it says, it's coming out, ascending out of the bottomless pit. 
And if you remember, we came across the bottomless pit in chapter 9. Chapter 9 from verse 1. And the fifth angel sounded. And I was, and I saw his star fall from heaven onto the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit. And there arose a smoke out of the pit. And the, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the, upon the earth, and unto them was given past copions of the earth have power. That Jesus is telling us that this beast, that he is the Antichrist. If we look at verse 8 again, chapter 17, verse 8, the beast which thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. That means that it will be the incarnation of the very devil himself. And then we're told that eventually he'll go into perdition. And in Revelation chapter 19, verse 20, go into perdition. Revelation chapter 19, looking at verse 20. And the beast was taken. And we see him, the false prophet, that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And so you see when it says it will go into perdition, that means that he will eventually be cast into the lake of fire. But before we leave at that uh, point one, uh, let me show you something in verse 8 of Revelation. Revelation chapter 17 verse 8. Very, very important for every one of us to take note of. The beast, you know, that's the Antichrist now. That thou sawest and uh, what it was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and shall go into perdition. Listen to this now. And they that dwell on the earth shall wander. Whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. From the beginning of the world, names have been written in the book of, of life. That is, as people are getting saved from the beginning of the world, as they are getting saved, their names have been written. As they are getting saved, their names are being written. As they are being forgiven, their names are being written. And as they are giving their lives to the Lord, their names are being written from the foundation of the world on and on and on until the present day. And then all the people that will remain on the face of the earth at that time, at the time of the great tribulation, that do not have their names in the book of life, they will wonder with great amazement, but they will not know the meaning. They will not understand because they do not have the spirit of God, because they do not have Jesus Christ, because they do not have light or insight into the word of God, they will be at sea. They will be confused. They will be amazed. But their amazement will be an amazement that will bring confusion and destruction upon them. But the Lord is telling us something that in our own case, we don't need to be amazed and confounded. The people of that time, the people that do not have the Lord Jesus Christ, their names are not in the book of life. They'll be amazed and confounded. They'll be speechless. They'll not know what to say. They'll not know what to make out of the things that are happening at the time of the great tribulation. Not only amazed and confounded, number two, they'll be amazed and confused. What are they going to do? Are they going to believe God? Are they going to believe the Antichrist? What are they going to do? It will not be a time of worldwide evangelism when believers are evangelizing because the believers have gone. They'll be amazed and confused. And then they'll be amazed and convicted. Convicted that they have sinned. Convicted that they are lost. And convicted that the day of grace has passed for those of them that have received the mark of the Antichrist. And then we who are now alive, before the time of the great tribulation, we should be amazed and concerned. That these things are going to come upon the world. And then we should, we're not confused, we're not confounded, but we ought to be concerned because of the things that will happen to the people at that time. What's the amazement of these people? And what was the amazement of John? Number one, amazement because of the appearance. It was like a monster. Number two, because of the apparel of the woman. When 
John the beloved saw in verse 4 and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of fornication it was an amazement and astonishment a wonder a surprise to John number one because of the appearance number two because of the appearance number three because of the ascension ascension that is the beast ascending out of the bottomless pit what a wonder what an amazement number four because of the atrocities because of drinking the blood of the saints what atrocities are these and when john saw that he was amazed and when the people of the world at the time of the great tribulation will see the real demonstration of it before their eyes when they see those atrocities they're going to be amazed number five because of abomination because we're told in verse five and upon her forehead was a name reaching mystery babylon the great the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth because of the appearance because of the apparel because of the ascension because of the atrocities because of the abominations and because of the attraction because of the attraction a monster normally should repel everyone a monster should push away everyone a monster should should be so fearful and terrifying that everybody will run away but uh, the thing that surprised john is that the people are attracted to him because even though it was a monster, yet it was able to perform some miracles that people said, who is able to make war with this? And then because of the activities, because of the activities of the Antichrist, that's why the surprise will come. But before you pass on, look at that verse 8 again, as it says, they, wonder, they shall wonder. They that dwell upon the earth shall wonder, whose names are, were not reaching in the book of life whose names were not written in the book of life. And if you're going to escape all these things that will come, your name must be in the book of life. It's not enough that you say you're religious. The question is, is your name in the book of life? You're religious, but is your name there? You are reformed, but is your name in the book of life? You are recognized in church, but is your name in the book of life? You have been reinstated. You know, there are some pastors and preachers in various denominations. Maybe they're in a particular denomination. And the denomination has said they removed the cassock or the a uniform of the minister from them. And then they keep on pleading and lobbying. And eventually, they, in their management or whatever in that denomination, they say, okay, you can come back to the ministry. They are reinstated. But it's not reinstating them. That's important. Are you in the book of life? Religious, are you born again? Reformed, are you born again? Recognized, are you born again? Reinstated, called back from the discipline, are you born again? Renowned, that people know their names and they are highly placed in their denomination, are you born again? Reverenced, reverend so and so, reverend such and such. But even though you are reverenced, are you born again, registered? You are registered among the knights of the denomination. And then the Pope or whoever it is has given you a great title. And your people are celebrating. The question is, is your name in the book of life? You are baptized in water, you are confirmed. Or you are ordained, or you are anointed. This is the day when people are going about. They're going to that church. They're going to that other church because they're anointing them there. They're anointing them with oil. They are baptized or confirmed or anointed or ordained. But the question is: Are you actually? Are you born again? Is your name in the book of life? Lord, I care not for riches, neither silver nor gold. I would make sure of heaven. I would enter the fold in the book of Thy kingdom with His spirit is so fair tell me jesus my savior is my name reaching there lord my sins they are many like this like the sands of the sea but thy blood O lord my savior is sufficient for me for thy promise is reaching in bright letters that glow though your sins be as scarlet i will make them like snow oh that beautiful city 
with its mansions of light, with its glorified beings in pure garments of white, where no evil sin cometh, to despoil what is fear, where the angels are watching, yet is my name reaching there, is my name reaching there. On the page, white and fear, in the book of thy kingdom, is my name reaching there. That's the important thing, that's what you are asking yourself, and that's what you are asking the Lord. Did you hear that man that said last night, as I was sleeping, the dream came to me. I dreamt about the end of time and about eternity. I saw a million sinners fall on their faces to pray. The Savior suddenly shook his head and I heard him say, Sorry, I never knew you depart from me forevermore. Sorry, I never knew you go and serve the one that you searched on earth. I thought the time had come. When I must stand the trial, I told the Lord that had been a Christian all the while. But through the book, he then looked and sadly shook his head. They placed me over on the left hand side, and this is what he said Sorry, I never knew you. I find no record of your name here. I find no record of your birth. Sorry, I never knew you. Go and serve the one you served while on the earth. That was my wife. And my children and i had each one's voice they must have been all happy it seemed they did rejoice with robes of white around them and crowns upon their head my little girl looked up at me and this is what she said daddy we can't go with you we must stay on this lovely shore sorry for we still love you but you cannot be a daddy anymore if your name is not in the book of life you are going to be a loser for all eternity you will not be able to sing with the angels you'll not be able to stay with the saints of god although you've been going to church although you've been coming to bible study if your name is not in the book of life you're going to weep tears of regret and sorrow forever and ever this man said when i from sleep awaking with tears in my eyes i looked around and there about me to my great surprise i saw my wife and babies and knew i had a the dream then down beside my bed i fell and for mercy i screamed father who art in glory in mercy look on me today forgive me let me serve you till the summons come and call me away the Lord is saying that we need to prepare for the time for eternity. When the Lord himself, when he will call us home one by one. But your name must have been written in the book of life before you'll be able to make it on that day. Revelation chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 15. Revelation chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Whosoever was not found reaching in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire and oh what a weeping and wailing as the lost were told of their fate at that time they'll pray but then it will be too late this is the time to seek the face of the lord before it becomes too late i go to point number two the decision and defeat of the monster and his army the decision and the defeat of the monster and his army in revelation chapter 17 verses 13 and 14 these have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast they these shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them for he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Here we find something that says, These have one mind, that is, the ten horns of the seven-headed monster are united in the promotion of the same evil plan. They want to fight against God, against Christ. In verse 14, These shall make war with the Lamb. And then he tells us that... They are just going to continue for one hour for a brief moment of time. They shall give their power and strength unto the beast. 
the revived kingdoms of the end time Roman Empire will be united in support and submission under the kingdom of the Antichrist. The Antichrist will be so mighty and so powerful as the kings all give their power and strength to him. And then it says something, it says they shall make war with the Lamb. They will unite under the Antichrist and they will fight against Christ the Lord, Christ the King. But then he tells us, the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is the Lord of lords and King of kings, Christ's victory. The Lord's triumph is certain. It has been predetermined over all the forces of evil and all the power and the army of the Antichrist. And then we're told that Christ, the Lord of lords, King of kings, he has supreme power over all the earth and over all the kings and all the powers. And all those things will be conquered and subdued by him. And let's look at supporting verses telling us about this evil unity. You think it's only in the church that there's unity. No, there's unity out there too. And there is unity among all the followers of the Antichrist. And all those who are worshipping the enemy, the devil. There's unity among them too. And the, uh, the unity is not just starting now. The unity started long, long ago at the building of the Tower of Babel. In Genesis chapter 11, reading from verse 1. Genesis chapter 11, reading from verse 1. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found the plain in the land of China. And they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, behold, the people is one. Behold, the people is one. They were in their multitudes, but the Lord said, is one. And they have all one language. And this they began, they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. You understand then this kind of evil unity. A kind of unity that, um, uh, that is just to perpetrate evil. And it says it's for the purpose of fighting against Christ. Fighting against the king of kings. And fighting against the Lord of lords. In Ezekiel chapter 38. Ezekiel chapter 38. I'm reading from verse 10. Thus says the Lord God. It shall come to pass, it shall also come to pass, that at the same time shall things come into thy mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought, evil thought, to think of fighting against Christ, to think of waging war against the King of Kings, against the Lord of Lords. And then it says, thus, and thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest and will safe and will safely and, and that dwell safely. All of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates to take a spoil and to take a prey to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations which have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land it's telling us the unity that people have and it's unity to fight against the lord it's unity to fight against the king of kings and the lord of lords. This talking about the time of the great tribulation. But even now, there are people that will unite together and fight against Christ. There are people that will unite together and fight against the will of God. There are people that will unite together and fight against the doctrines of Christ. But all those who do that, they need to hear before they start the fight. That they have been defeated before they even start the fight. Because the king of kings and the lord of lords, he will overcome them. We're told in Psalm 2, reading from verse 1. Psalm 2 verse 1. 
Why do the heathen rage? And the people imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh, the Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. They'll be overcome because says, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. The people that wage war against the Lord, there's no way they can overcome. There's no way they can win. If you're fighting against the Lord, if you're fighting against the doctrines of the Lord, there's no way you can win. You are defeated before you stand the fight. In Psalm 21, reading from verse 8. Psalm 21, reading from verse 8. Then thine hand shall find out thine enemies. Thy right hand shall find out those that hate thee. Thou shalt make them as a fairy omen in the time of thine anger. The Lord shall swallow them up in his wrath, and the fire shall devour them. Their fruit shall thou destroy from the earth, and their seed from among the children of men. For they intended evil against thee. They imagined a mischievous device which they are not able to perform. You see the people that are imagining something evil against the Lord, against the word of God, against the will of God, and against the anointed of the Lord, against Christ. It says they have imagined a, a, a mischievous device which they are not able to perform therefore shall thou make them turn their back when thou shalt make ready thine arrows upon thy strings against the face of them the lord will overcome them i said the lord will overcome them and that's the reason we ourselves who are here now we need if you be if there's anything you're fighting against you're fighting against the doctrines of the bible or you're fighting against the will of god or you're fighting against the plan of god or you're fighting against the church of the living god you know that all those who do that they'll not be able to perform their mischievous design or their mischievous plan they imagine the mischievous device which they are not able to perform they're not able to carry out drop your arms throw away your weapon or warfare against the Lord because the Lord shall reign and every knee shall bow every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord let's come back to Revelation chapter Revelation chapter 17 I'm reading to you from verse 14 Revelation chapter 17 we're looking at the latter part of verse 14 it says here it says the lord for the he is the lord of lords and king of kings and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful here you find something you find that on the one hand there are people that are waging war against the lord on the other hand there are people that are worshiping the lord some are for warfare the others are for worship some are for fighting the others are for fellowship and it says that the people that are for fighting and the people that are for war, warfare, they're defeated. They're crushed. They're taken out of the way. And they die. And they go to the lake of fire. But it says, that's not the whole of the people. Because there are some of us who are here who love the Lord, who serve the Lord, who believe the Lord. I don't want to keep on worshiping the Lord. They are for war. We are for worship. They are for fighting. We are for fellowship. And it gives us the characteristics of these people that are for worship and for fellowship. They are called, number one. Number two, they are chosen. Number three, they are faithful. They are called. They are chosen. And they are faithful. It tells us in First Thessalonians chapter 4, First Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm reading verses 7 and 8. Our calling. Our calling. We are called. In First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. For God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who has also given us of his Holy Spirit. We are called. Number one, called to salvation. Number two, called to separation. Number three, called to sanctification. Number four, we are called to service. 
and you check up in your life when he says we're called because they that are with him the people that are with the lord and the people that will make it at the time of the rapture and then they'll be with the lord and they'll be coming from the Azure above when the devil when the antichrist will want to drive away christ will want to wage war with the lamp and with the saints of god the people that will be with the lord jesus they'll be number one the people that have been called to salvation have you responded to that call of salvation number two the people that have been called to separation and be not conformed to this world but be renewed in your mind that you may prove that which is good and accepted and perfect will of God. Call to separation, then call to sanctification, purity of heart and holiness. That the Lord will take away the Adamic nature, the stony heart. And then he will give you the heart of flesh. Have you responded to the call to sanctification and then the call to service? That you are serving the Lord with all your heart, all your soul and all your mind. And you are serving the Lord in sincerity. Called the salvation, separation, sanctification, and service. Number two, chosen. Chosen. In 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 9. In 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Chosen unto salvation, chosen unto separation, and chosen unto sanctification. Because it says, if he man therefore purge himself from all this, he'll be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use and prepare unto every good work. You are chosen unto sanctification, and then you are chosen for service. But then he talks about being faithful. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 2. Colossians chapter 1 verse 2 to the saints and the faithful brethren in Christ to the saints and the faithful brethren in Christ faithful in salvation faithful in separation faithful in sanctification and faithful in service and the question is are you faithful you have been called you have been chosen are you faithful to your calling are you faithful to what you are chosen to do and what you are chosen to be? Have you been have you responded to the Lord to that call unto salvation and that call unto separation? Because he that will be a friend of the world, he'll be an enemy of God. But pure religion and undefiled before God is this that you'll visit the widows in their in their affliction, and then that you keep yourself unspotted from the world, called to separation. And called to sanctification, I've seen from all appearance of evil. And then the God of peace sanctify you, Holy Spirit, soul, and body. And that you'll be preserved in that holiness and sanctification until the coming of the Lord. Until that final day, faithfully see who has called you, who also will do it. You are called, you are chosen. You have not chosen me, I have chosen you. And I put you, ordained you, that you should go forth and bear fruit. As the Lord has chosen you to service, are you doing that service, sacrificial service? Are you yielding your service, everything to the Lord? Are you faithful in the things the Lord has called you to? Or you are insincere and unfaithful? Please remember again, Revelation chapter 17 and in verse 14. It says, and he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. I come to point number three. The desolation and the destruction of the mother of abominations. In Revelation chapter 17, we're reading from verse 15. Revelation chapter 17, reading from verse 15, and it says unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the was seated, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the worm, and shall make her desolate and naked. And shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put in their hearts to fulfill his will. And to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast. Until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. The desolation. 
The desolation of the mother of abominations. The destruction of the mother of abominations. Here we're told the woman without soil is a great city. That's verse 18. Which reigneth over the kings of the earth. The woman represents mystery Babylon. That is religious Babylon. That is the apostate church. With all the systems of false religion. Then it tells us in verse 15. That the waters which thou sowest, where the war seated, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. The false worship of mystery Babylon, the mother of abominations, will influence and control the minds of multitudes of people in the nations of the world. That's why it says in that verse 15 that the waters represented the nations upon which the woman is having control, upon which the mother of abominations is having control. That's what it symbolizes by saying, sitting upon those waters, their peoples, their multitudes, their nations, and their tongues. And that mystery Babylon, false religion, apostate church, falling church, will control multitudes of people in all the nations of the world. The Antichrist will use false, the false prophet who will perform deceptive miracles and lying wonders to sway people and to win and to hold the, the minds of men. After achieving his purpose and gaining control over the whole world, the Antichrist and his political alliance will turn against the religious movement of Babylon. Religious Babylon eventually will be destroyed. That's why it says in verse 16, And the ten horns which thou sawest, representing the kingdoms of that time of the Antichrist, that is, that thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the world. Eventually, after you sin age, after controlling it, after using its influence, and these shall hate the war, and shall make and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. You say, how so? How is that going to be so? Because that's what the Lord Himself will do. It tells us in verse 17: For God has put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and to give their kingdoms unto the beast listen to this until the words of god shall be fulfilled that's what that's what god has uh, determined uh, that's what is going to actually take place at the end of time as we look at this and we see that mystery babylon is going to fall again let me remind you that this wasn't anything totally new to john because uh, he knew from the prophecies of the prophets that went before him that this is exactly what will take place at the end of time in jeremiah chapter 51 verse 13 jeremiah chapter 51 verse 13 O thou that dwellest upon many waters abundant in treasures thine end is calm and the measure of thy covetousness referring to mystery babylon that woman that all that we have read about in revelation chapter 17 and this is what jeremiah is saying O thou that dwellest upon many waters the waters of multitudes and of people and of nations and of tongues. Thou that dwellest upon many waters, abundant in riches. We've read that in Revelation chapter 17, verse 4. Abundant in treasures. Thine end is calm and the measure of thy covetousness. In Ezekiel chapter 27, verse 26. Ezekiel chapter 27. Reading there in verse 26. Thy rowers have brought thee into great waters, and the east wind has broken thee in the midst of the sea. That means eventually destruction, devastation, desolation will come in Isaiah chapter 13. Isaiah chapter 13, reading from verse 17. Behold, I will stir up the medis against them which shall not regard silver and as for gold they shall not delight in it their bows also shall dash thy young men to pieces and then it says they shall have no pity on the fruit of the womb their eyes shall not spare the children and babylon the glory of the kingdoms the beauty of the chaldeans excellency it says shall be as when god overthrew sodom 
and Gomorrah. It tells us that the end will eventually come and it will come for this uh, mystery Babylon. Uh, we go back to Revelation chapter 18. In Revelation chapter 18, reading from verse 8, Revelation chapter 18, verse 8. Therefore, shall a plague come in one day, death and mourning and famine. And shall and she shall be utterly burnt with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judges her. Strong is the Lord God that judges her. Verse 16. Saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was closed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour so great riches has come to naught, and every shipmaster and all the of the company in, in ships and sailors and as many as trade by the sea stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? And and they cast doors on their heads and cried weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein they made rich all that achieves in the sea by reason of her costliness. For in one hour is she made desolate. That's the judgment that will come upon literal Babylon as well as mystery Babylon as well as spiritual Babylon in chapter 19 of Revelation from verse 1. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he has judged the great all, adulterer, that woman, that, that uh, mother of abominations, he has judged her, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and has avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. Judgment is going to come. But as the judgment is going to come, the question is, where do you stand? Where are you today? And if the rapture should take place any moment from now, where will you spend eternity? Will you go with the beloved, with the children of God, and meet the Lord in the air? Or is there a weight that is weighing you down here? A weight of sin, besetting sin, that is weighing you down here, and you will not be able to go. Is it that the Jezebels of this world are tying you down? The Delilahs of this world are tying you down. Or is the wedge of gold or the goodly Babylonish garment that Achan stole, that he took, that is what is tying you down? And how will it be on that final day when the Lord shall come? And then there is still sin that is holding you down and you are not able to go. That's why the Lord is warning us and is saying, seeing that all this sin shall be so. We're looking at Second Peter chapter 3 verse 11. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 11. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. For some people, it may be that it's some money that is when you the love of money, when you down, business, when you down, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, when you down. And running up and down, not finding time for the salvation of your soul. That is weighing you down. Dubious business, fraudulent business, 419. That is what is holding you down. And then it says everything shall be melted away with fervent heat. Or the Lord is calling you to salvation. And it is because of that adulterous woman, that adulterous man, that polygamous man, that a second wife. That's what is holding you down. And the Lord is saying, what, shall you, what will you do at that time? What shall you profit a man if he gains the whole world and then he loses his own soul? Or maybe it is, you know, it is prosperity, it is promotion, it is progress. I want this, I want that. I must get this, I must get that now. And you are not thinking about eternity, you are not thinking about your soul. When the world shall be on fire, 
fire. And when these devastations and destruction will come upon the world, where will you be at that time? The Lord is warning you now. Why don't you respond? Because it says we're looking for an hasting unto the coming of the day of God wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. All the money you keep in the bank, all the certificates you are running at, all the properties of this world, everything will go up in flames. And then it says in verse 13, nevertheless, we according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot, without spot, without blame, and blameless. The Lord is calling and the Lord is saying, judgment is coming. All will be there. And at the time of the destruction, devastation of Babylon, where will you be on that day? If you miss the rapture and then the great tribulation meets you here, what's going to be your Lord? In Hebrews chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 1. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1, wherefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them sleep. All the things we're hearing of the mystery of mystery Babylon, of false religion, of the apostate church, all the things we're hearing of the imminent return of the Lord, all the things we're hearing that the morning cometh, the morning of resurrection, and the morning of the rapture, and the morning of rejoicing is coming. And then after that, the night of the great tribulation will come. When, the, when that great tribulation comes, you will not be able to buy or sell. The Antichrist will rule over everything on earth earth and then at that time the people whose names are not written in the book of life they're going to worship that antichrist and where will you be on that day why the warning is coming to you today why the word of god is coming to you today if you have lost your salvation if you're living a careless life this is the time to get up and to say lord i give myself to you wherefore we ought to give the more honesty to the things what you have heard lest at any time we shall let them sleep for if the word spoken by angels was ten fast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation which at the force began to be spoken by the lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him if you neglect that salvation, remember Lord's wife. If you have been born again, you've given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. But the things in the world that are glittering, the things of the world that are attracting you, they're turning you back to the world. And you're no more serious about the things of the kingdom of God. How will you escape if you neglect so great salvation? We're told in Isaiah chapter 26. Isaiah chapter 26, reading from verse 20. Isaiah 26, verse 20. Come my people enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee hide thyself as seat for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed the lord is inviting us and the lord is saying come my people if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and shall seek my face and they will turn from their wicked ways and cry and pray unto me and seek my face i will hear from heaven i will forgive their sin I will heal thee and calm my people. Enter thou into thy chambers. Hide yourself from the sin. Hide yourself from the things that are taking place in this world. The things that are trying to make you that are beckoning to you. Come back to the world. Come back to the world. Hide yourself from them. Come my people. Enter thou into thy chambers. Shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself as sit were for a moment. It's just a short time now and then the Lord will come. You hide yourself until the indignation will will be overpassed. The Lord is telling us wherefore, seeing then that we are compassed about was so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross and despising the shame and is set now on the right hand 
ascent of the throne of God. The Lord is calling you today. You've had the call once again now. And the Lord is saying, if you are not saved, you ought to be saved. If you were saved and backslidden, you ought to return and run back to the Lord. And if you are saved but not sanctified, this is the time to lay everything upon the altar. Because without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. But the Lord is telling all the blessed at the pure in heart, for they shall see the Lord. And the Lord is saying, every besetting sin, every wage that is tying you down, you push everything aside, looking unto Jesus, the Savior, looking unto Jesus, the sanctifier, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, that now whatever persecution, whatever trial, enduring the cross and despising the shame, so that when the trumpet shall sound, we'll be able to go with him. How many of us are really taking heaven serious? How many of us are taking the kingdom of God serious? How many of us are taking the coming of the Lord serious? And you're saying, I don't want to be here at the time of the great tribulation. I want to go with the Lord when the Lord will come. The Lord is telling you then, if you are one of them, rise up on your feet. Forget everything about you. We're talking about eternal life. We're talking about when the Lord will come. And over there, wherever you are, you're listening to me over the satellite, or you're, you're hearing the sound of my voice, or anywhere, or you're over here in front of me, you need to call upon the Lord. Remember Lord's wife, if you have been born again before, but you're looking back, and you're no more looking at the Lord Jesus Christ, the things of this world that beckoning on you. The things of this world are distracting your attention. And the things of this world are taking your attention. Why don't you say, oh Lord, I'm coming back. Lord, I'm coming back. The word of God says that when you read that, when you read that revelation, when you read that uh, vision, you will run with it. Read and run. Read and reflect on that word and read and repent of your sin. Read and return. Return to the Lord. I, I will return unto my father. And I will say, Father, I've sinned against thee and I've sinned against heaven. I'm no more worthy to be called your child but make me one of your hired servants. And the Bible says in the very next verse and he arose and he arose and he arose and he arose and he came to the father and when the father saw him afar off he ran and they ran together embraced one another and his sins were forgiven and the joy of salvation came back the lord is calling you now the lord is calling you now won't you be saved today won't you be restored today won't you come back to the lord today if there's anything in your hand that you're holding on to restore that thing restitute that thing if there's anything you're holding on to and that that thing will hinder you from the rapture. That thing will hinder you from going with the Lord when he comes. Drop that thing. Restore that thing. Respond to the word of God. Respond to the word of God. Don't be like Lord's wife that heard but will not respond. And then you will, you will call upon the Lord and say, Lord, here am I. Lord, here am I. Lord, here am I. I want to follow you now. I want to follow you now. I leave all this frivolity behind. I leave all the unseriousness behind. I leave all the weights and all the besetting sin. I leave everything behind. Oh Lord, have mercy on me. Wash me in the blood of the Lamb. Make me whiter than snow. The Lord can do it now. The Lord can do it now. And then you make a covenant to the Lord between now and the time the Lord will come. You will not go back into that evil anymore. You will not go back into that evil anymore you are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses surrounded by a crowd of witnesses because judgment is coming judgment is coming and all the people that are not in the book of life they'll be amazed and confounded they'll be amazed and confused they'll be amazed and convicted but today is the time you need to call upon the name of the lord and say lord lord i want to be there when you come i want to be there when you come i want my name in the book of life my question to you is is your name in that book of life is your name in that book of life or do you care for riches or silver and gold is what you're running after don't you want to make it to heaven at last don't you want to enter into his fold in the book of god's kingdom in his pages so white and fair tell me lord jesus my savior is my name reaching there is my name reaching there? Is my name reaching there? Is my name reaching there? Let the Spirit of God bear witness with your heart that your name is in the book of life. Because if your name is not in the book of life, it doesn't matter how religious you are. And it doesn't matter how recognized you are. It doesn't matter what people are saying about you. If your name is not in the book of life, you are lost and lost forever. Is my name reaching there? Is my name reaching there? Is my name reaching there? On the page white and fear, in the book of thy kingdom, O Lord, is my name reaching there? Lord, my sins, there are many. 
like the sands of the sea. But thy blood, O oh my Savior, is sufficient for me. For thy promise is reaching. In bright letters that glow, though your seas be as scarlet, I will make them like snow. The Lord is saying you can come. You can come to the Lord tonight and you can tell the Lord, Oh Lord, I don't want any stain of sin to remain. I don't want any spot of sin to remain. I don't want any blemish of sin to remain. I want you to cleanse me. I want you to wash me. I want you to grant me assurance of my salvation. Assurance of my salvation. And the grace and the power to live the victorious life and the overcoming life. The Lord has given you the promise. Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, I'll make them as white as snow. And though they be red like crimson, I'll make you as white as wool. Oh, that beautiful city. With his mansions of light, with his glorified beings and pure garments of white, where no evil sin cometh to, to despoil what is fear, where the angels are watching, yes, my name is reaching there. Yes, my name is reaching there. On the page, white and fear in the book of God's kingdom, yes, my name is reaching there. Make sure you have that assurance before you leave. Make sure you have that testimony of the Spirit of God before you leave. That your name is in the book of life. When you can shout it, when you can sing it, and when you can reveal it everywhere. Yes, my name is written there. My name is written there. On its pages, white and fair in the book of God's kingdom, my name is written there.